Um, today I'm going to be Phil Hopkins. Well, uh, Phil tried to convince me to give his talk for a third time, uh, but because he thought it would be a, it would be a, it would be a better delivery with a French accent. But um, I think it's not going to work. So uh, I'm going to talk about um, some 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 of my own work. Um, so uh, once again. Uh, it's actually good that uh, that that uh, was swapped with Phil because Joel introduced nicely what I'm going to talk about here, and this is work I've been doing. It's preliminary as well. Um, this is work I've been doing with uh, in collaboration with Adrian Sliz in Oxford and uh, my former PhD student Tyson Kim, now postdoc in Princeton. And Tyson is going to be looking for a job, so watch him. He's a he's a real star. All right. So the outlook of my talk is so I'm going to talk about um, the impact of turbulent star formation, and turbulent should be in quote here in this title, and you'll see why in a minute, on, uh, on high redshift galaxy properties. And so um, the outlook of my talk is going to be fairly simple. I'm going to present the problem. I'm going to try to make the case for why we should worry about turbulence in the simulations. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk about the modeling efforts uh, that have been done uh, to take that into account. And finally, I'll uh, discuss uh, the results the recent results we've obtained and, and the impact that this has on the galaxy properties at higher redshift. All right, so what is, what is the question? The question is simple, is, is simply how should we form stars in this cosmological simulations, right? So should we be using the observed star formation uh, surface gas density relation? This is the or, or standard Kennicott plot. And uh, what I want to say here is uh, basically this law that is measured uh, that this uh, surface density of star formation rate proportional to gas surface density to power 1.5 is this simply a uh, Schmidt law uh, with a given efficiency, right? <coughs> or is it telling us something more complicated? And I would argue that, you know, uh, this is average on, on kiloparsec scale. So as long as in, in your simulations you have a resolution of kiloparsec, it's probably um, fine to use that. However, um, if, you, um, if you go to high resolution simulations, as, uh, such as Joel was mentioning, and you have 10 parsec resolution, you should, in principle, be able to resolve the structures uh, of, of disk uh, or, or galaxies. And so you should worry of whether this is actually the way you should implement star formation. Okay? And so if you answer the question, um, uh, positively, that this is, um, this is how you should do star formation, then uh, uh, generally what people do is a two-parameter implementation of that. So basically, uh, you only form stars above a certain, when the density of gas goes above a certain threshold um, in the simulation. So this threshold actually depends on the resolution of the simulation, right? The better resolution you have, the higher this threshold is going to be. And Joel has argued nicely that, uh, that uh, um, um, you need to go to a, to a very high threshold star formation to get realistic galaxies. Uh, I think this is not enough, and we'll, 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 uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. And so basically, you could argue that you need to at least reach an average molecular cloud density, like 50 or 100 atoms per cc, uh, for this threshold to be, um, um, to be realistic for star formation. And then you apply um, um, the simple Schmidt law with an efficiency um, of about 1%. So what you are assuming, in effect, is that the, the star formation efficiency, f um, so the, the amount of stars that you form per free fold time, is a universal parameter. All right? Now I'm a theorist, and to me this is deeply unsatisfying, right? Because um, I think I'm including some of the physics that's relevant for galaxy formation, right? And if that's the case, this efficiency for star formation should be a prediction from my simulations, right? I should, this 1% should come out, whether it's, you know, whether it's driven by turbulence, feedback, or whatever, if I'm including these processes, then this 1% should come out. All right, so this is deeply unsatisfying, but, you know, it needs to be done. So why would you need to reach, let me just briefly I uh, mentioned why would you need to reach average molecular cloud densities? Well, uh, you can look at these nice observations here um, uh, of um, gas and star uh, formation uh, in different um, um, tracers. And what you see, if you look at, at the, oh, there's a pointer here. Um, 
Yeah. That's that's a laser pointer. That one should work if I can figure it out. Yeah. So if you look at traces for recent star formation, here is dust emission. Here is H alpha, um, and you see you see that uh, this seems to correlate way better um, with the molecular gas traced here by CO emission than the atomic gas. Okay. Um, so, hence the claim that you need to reach at least high densities for the threshold in order um, um, to get realistic um, star formation in galaxies. Here is another way to do it. It's the same uh, um, uh, surface density of stars versus uh, gas density here. The gas density is split in H1 and H2, and you see that the correlation is actually much better with H2 than it is with H1. Okay. So, and I've told you that um, this were observations average on kiloparsecs uh, scale. So actually, this is a this is taken from paper by by Mark, where he has actually plotted in red here symbols the Milky Way clouds. And what you see is that this epsilon, uh, effic this efficiency for star formation uh, in in molecular clouds seems to be also uh, very low. Okay. Now this is not average on kiloparsec scale anymore. This is average on cloud scale. So I would say hundreds of parsec um, scales. And, but in these high resolution simulations that we have now with 10 parsec, we actually, uh, at least for the most massive clouds, we actually partially resolve them. All right? And so the big caveat in this is even if you look at molecular clouds, so that's observations of the Perseus molecular cloud, the scale is given here by Heidermann et al. What you see, this is a molecular cloud, what you see is that stars do not form everywhere in the molecular cloud. So even if you reach this high density of molecular cloud, star formation is not, does not happen everywhere. Here, what you should see, uh, what you should look at is the, uh, uh, is the yellow and red objects, which are stars which have not yet ma migrated outside of the regions where they were formed. Okay? So when you see that they cluster nicely, they don't form all, all across the, the cloud. In other words, I would claim that molecular cloud reaching average densities of molecular cloud is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. All right, and so basically, uh, essentially, uh, this is a difference between forming stars with a low efficiency everywhere in the cloud or um, versus high efficiency in dense cores only. And here is a paper by Phil um, where he actually compared uh, several um, um, star formation recipe that you can use in in uh, isolated uh, galaxies um, and mergers. Um, and, um, and basically, I focused here on three. That's the density threshold criteria uh, that I'm talking about. Here is an isolated disk, right? Here is, um, um, in this column, is the, the same, uh, the same uh, star formation recipes, but for merger. Okay, and so there's uh, so there is the the density formation threshold here. Uh, this is um, an attempt of forming stars uh, where there are molecules, so the molecular tracer um, uh, thingy, uh, and and this is um, an, another criteria that we'll come back um, to in detail, where you actually um, um, form stars uh, in in regions which are self-gravitating. Okay. And what you see here is the star formation rate as a function of time. For these three things, it's dark blue, um, um, light blue, and purple. And you see that the star formation history for the Milky Way type galaxy are not very different. Okay? Um, and also for the, um, for the high uh, redshift merger, it's not very different. However, um, in details, where you form the stars, differs vastly. So um, another way to look at this um, is these curves, which show uh, the density weighted distributions uh, for star formation rate for, different, for the different star formation pres prescriptions. Just focus on the top three. Um, and what you see, essentially, it's where you are forming stars. What is the density of the gas uh, where you are forming the stars in the simulation? And you'll see that this self-gravity criterion that I will come back to later um, forms stars in in, in the, I would claim in the proper way, in the sense that you mainly form stars in the highest density region to your simulation. Your density threshold here is very interesting because the density threshold here is 100 atoms per cc. And what you realize that you're forming all your stars at the density threshold uh, of your simulation, or most of them. Okay? 
And so here's the same plot for the, uh, for the merger, which is even more dramatic uh, in the case of the self-gravity because uh, the, the peak at the threshold of molecular clouds here, um, average density of molecular clouds, is greatly suppressed. And so the molecular criterion here forms stars even at the lower uh, um, density. The, it peaks at even a lower density than the simple density threshold. So what's the missing ingredient? Well, turbulence is the missing ingredient, I would argue. So here is a beautiful picture uh, of, um, of CO emission um, um, in, the, uh, um, in the torus molecular cloud. What you see is, in it's, so basically you see the CO intensity in different velocity bends. The blue ones are coming towards you, um, green ones is about abreast, and red ones are going away from you. And what you see, um, that's the scale here, um, and what you see is that uh, you see a big, you know, a big mass. You see turbulence. There's no doubt about it. And so there's evidence for that the interstellar medium and molecular clouds are, um, are, are supersonically turbulent has been known for a while. Here is the standard Larson relations, which, line, which um, uh, basically relates the, line, the, the size of the molecular cloud to the line width size. And if it was uh, uh, incompressible turbulence, the exponent here they would be a third. Okay? And what you see is that since that gas we know is at about tal Kelvin, right, the sound speed is here. So you, all these clouds are very supersonically turbulent um, 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 velocities. Okay? So, and at some point, if you draw a vertical line here, you can see where you transition from supersonic turbulence to subsonic turbulence, and that happens on scales. Uh, which are about 0.1 parsec. So we don't resolve these scales, okay? In the, even with the highest resolution cosmological simulations that we have today, we don't resolve those scales. So we are in the supersonically turbulent regime, okay? Now, what, what does this have to do with star formation? Well, <coughs> it has been argued that um, the, uh, the stars actually form um, in regions where this uh, transition to subsonic turbulence has occurred. Here is a, uh, is a fantastic observation of, of, uh, by Pineda et al. of, uh, of, a per of um, um, a, the Perseus molecular cloud. And what you see here is the region, so basically what they did is that they um, uh, measured the, uh, the fine structure um, NH3 lines uh, and what you see is that in the region where you, where you actually forming a protostar, you see that um, the uh, velocity dispersion is low enough uh, that the, you can actually separate the two components. And as you move away along this direction and you enter the supersonically um, uh, turbulent dominated regime, this line becomes broader and then goes away. All right. And so this has been. So basically, and, and so stars form in the region where turbulence has dissipated enough in the cloud that it's, it's dominated by, um, um, by, son uh, by um, uh, thermal motions, okay? So that's the claim. Now, the problem is, is, is what drives this turbulence. So here is a simulation. So you can think it's, it's been driven by internal processes. Here is a simulation by, by Wang et al. that actually um, shows you how you can drive um, um, a messy, um, um, a messy um, uh, turbulent region with, uh, with jets, outflows, radiation uh, from stars. Um, but the problem with this is that we also know that in non-star forming molecular cloud like uh, the Polaris, we have a beautiful observation that show that this cloud is turbulent. There's not a single star in this cloud, right? So, um, so basically, Turbulence has to have a source that is also external, okay? Um, and so essentially this is, uh, this is good news for us because we should be able to capture at least that turbulence even if we don't know how to do feedback properly, okay? And so here's an example of a si an isolated simulation by Tasker and Tan, um, which was then revisited by, uh, by Von Lu. Uh, later, so you re did a re-simulation of this region, and you see when you increase the resolution, what happens is that you get more and more structure in this cloud, so you're pumping the energy from the galactic shear and the cloud motion to actually drive the internal turbulence of these clouds. Okay, 
So, uh, um, okay, I've talked about turbulence. So, how can we use that? How can we use this this thing to this the properties of the turbulence to make our star formation better in the in the in the numerical simulations? So, essentially. Uh, you do it through uh, the uh, the probability uh, the, um, the density probability function. So here is um, the quiet region in the in the Polaris flare. Uh, again, that's observations, and you can measure the density, the probability density distribution of the gas there. There's no stars, remember. So before any stars form, all right. And so it turns out that this is a log normal. Okay, this is the log normal probability density, um, and so. It's, it's characterized by S, which is just the ratio of the density of the gas to the average density, okay, and the, uh, the width, okay. So what is, the question then is what is the width of this probability distribution? Well, the width is actually driven by two things, um, turbulence, but it actually depends on what exactly what turbulence is doing the driving. So here are simulations by Christoph Federoff and, and collaborators where they simulate a box, a, a, an individual cloud as a, as a box, right? And they, they force the turbulence in that box. So they impose velocity, um, uh, uh, vel a velocity power spectrum of fluctuations um, on large scales. And you, there's essentially two ways you can do that, uh, either uh, using a solenoidal forcing, where uh, the curl um, of the velocity field um, is, um, is zero, or compressive forcing, uh, sorry, uh, where the divergence of the velocity field is zero, or a compressive forcing where the curl is zero. And, you, and this is a map of the colon density, and you see that it looks very, very different in these two things. And so what you do then, you just measure the, um, um, the, the PDF of the gas, right, in the simulations, okay? And what you see is that the width of this PDF not only depends on, um, because these, these are done with the same amount of turbulence, so the same RMS ve uh, velocity fluctuations, you see that the width depends on whether you're in a compressive mode or the solenoidal mode, okay? So essentially, what you can show from the simulations is that the, f the sigma s, the velocity, the, 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 the width of the distribution depends on the forcing, whether it's um, solenoidal or compressive, and the Mach number, so the amount of the RMS velocity fluctuation that you have. All right? So you're, when, you have done, when you've done that, you're almost done, because then you can use the PDF to derive the star formation efficiency. What you do is that you just simply integrate uh, from the critical a um, transition from, of the sonic regime, which scales like that. And then now you have a prediction um, for, the, um, um, for the star formation efficiency in the freefall time, which depends on the forcing, on the Mach number, and on this parameter, which, which is simply, um, it's called the virial parameter, uh, which is simply twice the kinetic energy divided by the gravitational energy. So all these, I would claim, you can measure from your, from your numerical simulation, okay? All right, um, there's a little bit of dust under the carpet in the sense that this model actually pre predicts um, the dense core mass function and not uh, the stellar initial mass function. Uh, so basically, there is a little epsilon factor here which should be of order unity um, uh, that is still there. Okay, and so here is a way to see it. These are observations from Alves et al. from the Tapezium cluster. This is the observed IMF. This is the observed dense core mass function. And what you see is that the dense core mass function has the same shape as the IMF um, uh, if you just shift the gray line uh, by, a, by about a factor four or so. Okay, so this, that's what this dashed line is, is just simply the gray line shifted there by a factor four or so. So it means that this epsilon parameter is like um, 25, 25, 50%. So essentially, uh, if you could plot it as a 3D plot, that's the star formation efficiency, right, as a function of the Mach number um, and the virial parameter. If you assume a mixture of solenoidal and compressible modes of 
0.44, which is very close to what's observed, and, and I'll come back to that, is very close to what you measure um, in simulations as well. Okay. And what you see is that you have wild variations depending on whether the cloud is bound, so alpha v are um, inferior to, uh, um, to 1 or not, you have tremendous variation in the star formation efficiency. Okay. So I should add that this model, this analytic model, is an excellent description of, of the star formation rate that's, or the dense core star formation rate that's measured in high resolution uh, simulations. And when I say high resolution, it's, it's AU simulation resolution of supersonic, tur driven supersonic turbulence. Here is an example for that from Padoan and Nordlund. And, um, and so basically, if you fit this model that I've just described from Federoth and Klesen to the simulation, that's a game they played, uh, you, can, you find reduced chi-square of unity in the terms of the star formation efficiency that you predict. So let me come back to how we should form stars in simulations. Well, um, you should get rid of the, of the resolution dependent density threshold and then just uh, form stars if your, um, your velocity dispersion, so that's the turbulence part, plus the sound speed squared, uh, is inferior to um, the um, gravity that it's bringing the gas together. Okay? So essentially, this is a self-gravity criterion if you set beta equals 1, or you could see it as a turbulent genes length criterion um, um, to pick the, lo the loci of star formation. In a sense, what we're saying here is that if gas is gravitationally unstable, um, um, and um, it will, it, there's nothing that will prevent it from forming stars, and so what we do is we form star, a star here, and the, we use the same law, but now the epsilon, the star formation efficiency, is this function from the Federoth and Klesen model. Okay. And what I would say is that when, we, when you do that, you're being self-consistent because these simulations by Federer and Klesen, from which they derive their, uh, their model, contains exactly the same physics that you put in in the cosmological simulation. There's, there's no difference. So in a sense, if we had AU resolution, if we were able to reach AU resolution, and turbulence was driven in the simulations, we would get the same star formation efficiency they would. So we're just extra using the results to extrapolate um, our star formation. Okay, so how wrong is this uh, that you know the clouds are self-gravitating? So with alpha v with variable parameters less than one, yes. How wrong is how wrong is this? Um, well, here are observations, local observation by Kaufman et al. It's a compilation of, of of all these observations. It's a measure of the variable parameters as a function of the mass of the cloud. And what you see immediately is that the very massive clouds, those that we can resolve in a cosmological simulations, I would claim above 10 to the 4 and, and yeah, above 10 to the 4 solar masses, they all more or less, you know, for the vast majority of them, they have variable parameters less than 2. So they're all uh, um, uh, gravitationally um, uh, bound. Okay? So here, let me come to the parts of the results. I'm like, trailing by a lot, a lot of time. But um, so what we did is that we set up uh, a series of, of, um, of simulations that we call Nut. Uh, that's the name in Egyptian. That's the, uh, um, that's the Egyptian goddess uh, of the night, of the sky. Um, that's where the French word nuit comes from. And since we were using Ramses, it, we kept up with the uh, Egyptian theme. Um, and so essentially, um, it's, um, it's an AMR simulation, so it's identical initial conditions with dark matter, particle mass of 5, 10 to the 4 uh, solar masses, uh, in, uh, halo of 5, 10 to the 11 solar masses, redshift 0. And uh, what we did is that we included different star formation, this different star formation recipe, and also two different uh, type 2 supernova um, feedback implementations. I don't have the time to go into the details of this, I would just say briefly that <coughs> the first one is that which, um, um, we, um, we um, used the Dubois and TCA 2008 formalism and we just put a set of solution uh, after a, time, a 10 megahertz time delay in our simulations. Um, and then we compare that to the Kim and Chen prescription which, uh, which self-consistently check whether or not we are able to capture this phase, in which case this energy conserving phase, in which case the same model is used. Otherwise, we use a momentum conserving phase. And here's a, a, um, 
resolution study um, and available in the Kim and Chan paper that shows you that um, 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 if you um, basically have enough resolution, these two, um, this two things uh, converge to the same answer. All right, so how does it look like? So um, that's the galaxy we're going to be focusing on right here. Um, here is, uh, is, um, is, the, is the turbulent star formation model. And what I've done to show you what, uh, what the difference between the star formation recipe to illustrate it here is that in blue are the contours where we go above um, the isodensity contours in a slice of the simulation through the disk, where we are at the, above 100 atoms per cc. And in green are the gravitationally unstable regions uh, uh, prescription. So what you end up doing, you see, uh, here is that you are forming um, stars in the turbulent or the gravitationally instable regions only with very high efficiency only in some places in, in this molecular clouds. So does it make a difference? Do we care? Um, so I'm going to compare here, uh, I'm going to try to convince you that it does. We can compare three simulations with a density threshold prescription with no feedback, the energy conserving supernova feedback the momentum conserving supernova feedback. And then the same three simulations with the th same three of, uh, prescriptions for feedback, i.e. no feedback, energy conserving, momentum con conserving, but just changing the, uh, uh, the prescription for star formation. So how does it look, the galaxy look for this, um, for this different prescriptions? Right? Here is the um, standard um, uh, density threshold. So the density threshold here is 400 atoms per cc. Okay, so um, uh, here is no feedback, energy conserving feedback, momentum conserving feedback. Here is the same with the turbulent uh, star formation prescription, no feedback, energy conserving, momentum conserving. Okay, and you see that it looks very, um, so that's the gas density, all right, seen face on, that's edge on. Right? So you see the first one, the no feedback with the density threshold, razor thin disk, which flares at some point, right? And then you start adding the feedback, so that's the inefficient energy conserving feedback, as the very efficient momentum conserving feedback. Here's the disk with no feedback in the turbulent prescription, energy conserving and uh, momentum conserving. All right, so let's go a little bit, now that I've shown you how they look like, let me just go into a little bit more into the quantitative details of it. So here are phase diagrams. Um, so that's, ma that's mass weighted, that's the temperature versus density in all these runs. And essentially what you see is that, um, of course, and so these lines are constant genes uh, length. These ones are constant pressure. And the resolution of our simulation is the corresponds to genes length of 10 parsec thermal genes length is here. Okay. And so if you have no feedback, of course, it stops at the cooling stops at around 10 to the 4K or so uh, because you have no metals. If you have metals and you have different um, style formation recipe, you see that the, the uh, phase diagrams are completely massively different. It's just because the metals are getting mixed much, much more. So now, to, uh, just let me briefly convince you that, um, that we are in the supersonically turbulent regime. Here is, um, so I'm going to skip on this velocity dispersion plot, but as the phase diagrams, this is the log of the Mach number. And, these, and, and so a Mach number of unity is here, this line here. Okay. And so what you see that is that in dense regions, in all simulations, but particularly for the ones where the cooling can go very low, you are, you are at Mach numbers of, of order 10. So we are in the supersonic uh, turbulent regime. We are dominated by supersonically turbulence. Here is the measure between the mix of compressible, compressible and solid oil energy. And uh, you remember, I'll use this B parameter of 0.44 uh, uh, in my recipe for the efficiency of star formation. Well, here's 0.5. That's all the runs. It's pretty close to 0.5. Uh, compressible, the ratio, that's the compressible, the ratio of compressible energy to solid oil energy. All right, results. Um, st galaxy star formation rate. Well, it's a mess for all these runs, so let's take them two by two. No feedback runs. What you see is that uh, the histories are of the, the stellar mass at z, z equals three are comparable, They're about the universal baryon fraction. If you start including feedback, um, that's the energy feedback runs, 
you actually do nothing if, you're, if you have a density formation threshold. You actually reduce by less than a factor two the mass, the amount of stars that you form if you are turbulent star formation. If you go to the momentum feedback runs, you're able to reduce by a factor two in the uh, in the density threshold, but you're able to you actually reduce by a factor uh, by a factor seven in the uh, in the um, uh, in the uh, in the turbulent star formation run. And the most interesting maybe is the uh, is the uh, is the galaxy rotation curve. So here, what you see in, um, as, a, as solid lines is the, um, um, is the circular velocity, so basically a measure of the mass, if you want, so of all the components, dark matter, um, stars, and gas in the simulation. It's superimposed, and the symbols are, is the gas rotational velocity. And what you see, the color coding is the same. I haven't gone through that, but uh, in blue and gray are the, um, the runs without feedback. Okay. So if you don't have feedback and you have a high star formation density threshold, you have this enormous peak of velocity, of rotational velocity. And this gets worse as you increase the resolution of your simulation, you get higher and higher peak. We've done simulations with 0.5 parsec resolution, and this peak goes above 1,000 kilometers a second. Right? If you now use a, uh, simply use a turbulent star formation recipe that I've described to you, without putting any feedback, you get the gray curve. And lo and behold, the peak is gone. Right? And so you can easily understand that uh, in the sense that if you have a density threshold, the center of your galaxy, the gas at the center of the galaxy is always going to be above the threshold because that's where you have the highest gas density. And you're always going to form stars, even if you form them slowly. Um, you're always going to form stars, you're going to pile up stars, you get a very dense stellar core that forms, and this is not going to go away. It's going to be very difficult to destroy it. In the uh, turbulent star formation run, what happens is that, yes, you still have this very high density of gas in the center, but you also have very, very uh, strong um, velocity dispersion, so you suppress star formation in the center, and so you suppress uh, this peak. Okay? And this is completely degenerate with feedback, here in blue is the threshold for star formation with the momentum feedback prescription. Lo and behold, this core is gone as well. Okay, so um, let me just flash up my conclusion um, um, and, and, just, uh, and just say that it's good news that we, uh, we finally entered an era where we now have enough numerical resolution to resolve the turbulent ISM in cosmological zoom simulations. And the, here, the scale, height, the scale that's important is the scale height of the gas disk, because that's what's uh, uh, setting the, sc the, the scale of your clouds. Okay? And the bad news, in my opinion, is that we need to revisit the subgrid models that we've been using to take advantage of this extra resolution. Right? And in particular, we have to pay attention uh, to how we form stars in the simulation. Um, and then I hope I've convinced you that turbulence-driven star formation alone has potentially non-trivial consequences for the dynamics of central regions of the galaxy, and that when it's coupled to feedback, these changes actually be can become dramatic, even with a simple model, which we just have a, a standard set of solution for supernova, we can reduce uh, uh, the mass of stars that we form uh, with a uh, factor three more than what we do with the, uh, uh, with the density threshold star formation. That's it. Well, that is a very good question, of course. Um, so the claim that we, uh, that we're, our claim is that what we are resolving um, is, actually, um, is actually the large scales. So we're not, what we're doing is that we're saying, okay, um, we resolve the, 
whatever uh, turbulence there is on the, ten, on the 10 or 100 parsec scales, we, we have an idea, we get an order of magnitude of what we have in the simulations, and then we plug in onto the subgrid model of, of, of Christoph. So essentially what you would, their, uh, their box, their 4096 cube box, is the one cell in our simulation. So we measure the global quantities and we use their results to actually predict what star formation efficiency we should right. have. Right. That's right. That's right. That's 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 a worry. But uh, you know, as the resolution gets better, we we've so what we've done is that we've tried. Um, I haven't shown the results here because it's preliminary. But what we've tried is that we've tried upping the resolution of the simulations. Right. So we've gone from 10 parsec. We have simulations at 5 parsec. Simulations at 2.5 parsec. And when we measure on the on the 10 parsec scales uh, the uh, the values for this velocity dispersion. Okay, they vary, but not by much. So, you know, that's the best we can do. Yeah. Yes? What disrupts variable clouds in your simulation? Is it supernova energy? Um, in the momentum, in the momentum f uh, feedback runs, yes, that is. Yes. Yeah, that's right. But you know, that cannot be right. Well, and, and also, what, what I should say... I mean, in the real universe, that doesn't happen. No, 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 no. That, uh, sorry, I should correct that. No, it's not that because uh, because we have this 10 mega year time delay uh, before the supernova explodes, right? Yeah. So um, these um, uh, these clouds are also changing on whatever resolution we have during these 10 mega years, right? So, so what 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 discuss variable clouds before supernova starts? Before? Nothing, 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 okay. nothing. Right? Oh, I mean, turbulence, whatever. What? What? what, what, what it no, it it just changes the properties. So it's supernova energy with this molecular cloud. Well. One way or another, right? That's all we put in in there. So yes. if they are destroyed. Well, no. Uh, so that's what Phil um, does in his recipe. He takes a, a, an epsilon equals to one. What we do is more complicated than that. We we use the efficiency that's predicted by the by uh, Federoth and Klassen, right? So we use this. That's our that's our the value for epsilon, uh, which is their their model, which is given by by this complicated thing, right? So we measure the variable parameter, the Mach number in the simulations, and, f and f we assume B equals 0.44. And then from this chart, you can read what the star formation efficiency is. So we have a spatially dependent um, uh, star formation efficiency. And, and have you checked what that produces globally? I mean, yeah, the, so that's what I, I was very fast on this, because you know I mistimed myself pretty bad. But um, uh, you could check what it does. On you're, you're Oh, sorry. All right. That's that's the that's the difference between the two runs in the uh, in the star formation rate, and that's that's the mass of stars that you form. No, uh, that's this this is. The 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 yeah, yeah. So uh, the gray one is that the efficient. Well, all the numbers are very high. essentially. We form only stars where where alpha is 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 one is one or or smaller than that. So the efficiency is very high. Uh, it's it's always you know. Between anywhere between ten percent and and fifty percent, right? It's not a hundred percent, but it's close to it. But it's really close. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right.